Jiten. YouTube abhi on hai na, almost full hai. Abhi we cannot edit. YouTube YouTube usha madam karte hai. Many students are trying to join it, but you cannot edit. Ah, you ask them to join through the YouTube. हाँ ये जो लीक है जहे वो ऑलरेडी आती है स्टार्ट हो गया ओके ओके ठीक है ओके वो एक सौ सौ के बाद जाएगा नहीं ना इधर तो गुड आफ्टरनून सर हाँ गुड आफ्टरनून गुड आफ्टरनून सर गुड आफ्टरनून सर वी आर जस्ट वेटिंग फॉर अवर ऑनरेबल वाइस चांसलर सर uh, Dr. Garg has gone there to uh, ask his availability just. Okay, okay, no problem. One, two minutes more, sir. Yeah, but he will be online, isn't he? Sir, it's coming. Sir, it's coming. Yes, good. Good, sir. Good. Okay, sir. 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 Okay,
from several university we have participant here and uh, my dear faculty members and other faculty members of different departments of the university and dear students i welcome you all to this webinar today we have got a chance to listen to a very senior very senior geologist i think who is working in this field from last uh, more than 50 years or so maybe uh, so sir i welcome you uh, to this webinar on behalf of central university of punjab thank you very much sir to accepting you, our sir. invitation thank you thank sir you. thank you very much uh, <clears throat> good afternoon sir hello 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 camera or camera is not working i think video from our side this is okay uh, yeah yeah from your side video is not can you see me yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but i cannot see you anybody there uh, yeah it's yes, okay yeah good afternoon sir how are you ha ah, namaskar namaskar <laughs> namaskar sir you are in kolkata only yes yes aur kahan jayenge phans ke aap liye nahi nahi aapko bahut jagah jaane ke liye hai aap jahan chahenge wahan jayenge कहीं जाना ही मुश्किल है आप कैसे हाँ अभी थोड़ा पैंडमिक इनफैक्ट दिस मैन पटनायक केम टू मी एंड प्रपोज दैट वी शुड डिवाइड यू टू डिलीवर लेक्चर इनिशियली आई वाज हेजिटेंट आई थॉट दैट वंस दिस सिचुएशन बिकम्स नॉर्मल देन वी विल इनवाइट यू फॉर दिस प्लेस एंड वी लाइक टू हैव योर लेक्चर इन ऑफलाइन मोड because still i believe that the impact that offline interaction creates amongst the listeners and uh, and uh, the view point presented by the orator that is very well taken in offline mode and online mode it is still of course we have started but you know still it is uh, far from reality uh, nonetheless uh, because you know i could not talk to you for many months and i could not see you also during all this pandemic so i thought that this would be good opportunity to see to you number 1 and number 2 to listen to you on this very important topic and as sir uh, garg has said that uh, everybody knows your contribution the earth scientist every earth scientist and uh, that is why we see that uh, you know uh, uh, people students and teachers from several universities have joined today's webinar and uh, 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 this topic is very relevant and uh, you know as we all know that uh, you know now this subject geology is moving away from the core geology and it is much more uh, you know people are entering into applied aspect where there is interfacing of geology with other disciplines uh, but the core geology uh, the number of workers research researchers in the core geology field is diminishing and more and more of applied of course that is the ultimate but you know Uh, there there should be enough number of researchers in the country who deal with the core disciplines the core branches of any discipline and uh, there uh, you know your lecture would be really uh, you know inspiring uh, budding students who would like to pursue their career in core discipline of geology and uh, that is the, <clears throat> that is the main attraction so i'm personally thankful to you for agreeing to uh, patnaik's request and my request rather to uh deliver lecture in uh, you know this uh, webinar mode uh, but uh, this is not the compensation you have to come here not once but several times and i you know that this is very uh, you know budding department we don't have many teachers in the department uh, of course we we are going to initiate the selection process soon but that would take some time so in the meantime if you can come for longer period so that also i mean invitation is open i'll discuss about it and okay. so my thank you for um, uh, you know agreeing to deliver a talk on this very important issue uh, and uh, you know my comp please convey my compliments to madam uh, okay. thank you thank you thank you, you sir thank you lot sir yes so you can kindly start now sir <coughs> lecture for sita shuru karna lecture Sir, may I invite you to start your talk, sir? Directly. Okay. Before before I start, uh, am I audible clearly? Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. Sir. Okay. 
It's a honorable vice chancellor, Professor Tiwari, Professor Garg, and uh, the colleagues from Central University of Punjab, students, business scholars from elsewhere as well. Uh, it's a matter of great pleasure and honor to be invited to present this talk here. And in particular, in a department where I see, I, I have two former colleagues as faculty members from Isar Kolkata and Assam University. And of course, I know the Honorable Vice Chancellor quite well from his days in Mizoram University. And uh, so I think it's a great honor and a great privilege to present my talk in front of you. So if you permit me, I will take, it, uh, take the PowerPoint more. Yes, please. Perfect. It's okay? Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. So let me start. So thank you once again for this in invite. Uh, to present this talk. So I'm going to talk on metamorphism under extreme PT conditions. So, uh, and two topics that I will discuss today. One is on ultra high temperature metamorphism or which is called as UHT. And the second one is an ultra high pressure metamorphism or UHP. Now, now the important thing is that the out of the total amount of metamorphic rocks exposed in the crust today, only 10% or so belong to these particular two categories. So these are rather unusual type of metamorphism and they call for, so naturally they are interesting to us. Now, uh, this slide, uh, uh, has the slide changed? So this slide, uh, it's okay, the next slide? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. Okay. okay. So in this diagram, this is that classical fascist, metamorphic fascist diagram that you can find in every textbook. Now, as you can see, the two axes are the pressure of the uh, y-axis and temperature on the x-axis. And these are the different metamorphic fascist fields which are shown. As I said, 90% of the metamorphic rocks in the world will be covered within this field. But we are not going to talk about this. We are going far above in the pressure axis. And also we will be concentrating on the extremely higher temperature conditions. So two extreme conditions that we will deal today. And if I think of a new thing that happened in metamorphism since I was a student was these two features. They were not in the textbook when I was a student. The UHT or ultra high temperature metamorphism was suspected in 1968, but actually confirmed in 1980. So it is only in the last 40 years we come to know about UHT metamorphism. By definition, metamorphism more than 900 degrees Celsius, and the maximum reported temperature is 1050 degrees Celsius. This is the condition and definition of UHT metamorphism. So the temperature must be 900 degrees Celsius or more. The pressure, there is no limit on the pressure. It can vary between five to 12 kilobars, so this is mid-crustal to deep-crustal depths up to the Moho maximum 40 kilometers. Now, 
if I go down to the moho at uh, under normal conditions, I will get a temperature of about 700 degrees Celsius. 40 kilometers of depth will produce about 700 degrees Celsius. So where from we are getting this 900 or 1000 degrees Celsius? So this is the enigma. This is the question. So we need a mechanism to raise the temperature to cause UHT metamorphism. It is normally not achieved. And that is why this is rather rare in occurrence. Then I talk about the ultra high pressure metamorphism or UHP. Now, as you can see, it was discovered in 1983 and 84. Before that, nobody knew about it. So it is again in the last 40 years, these two new concepts of metamorphism came into existence. And in case of UHP, the pressure should be more than 27 kilobar. And temperature can be anything above 600 degrees Celsius. Now, 27 kilobar and 600 degrees centigrade is the boundary between quartz and quasite. As we all know, quasite is the high pressure polymorph of quartz, and this is the boundary. So, UHP metamorphic rocks should have quasite in it, not quartz. That's the one very important criteria. And also, in the UHP field, I will show you that the graphite diamond boundary is present. So it means if the rock has carbon, then the carbon will exist as diamond, not graphite, in case of UHP rock. So these two are very important conditions. But of course, not all rocks contain carbon. So not all rocks will contain diamond. But quartz is very common. And so naturally, we can expect more of quasite in the UHP rocks. The only problem is that quasite is unstable at lower pressures, so it gets transformed back to quartz. So we have to find out some evidence of former existence of quasite, which I will show you in due course. Now, this is again the uh, for easier visualization for the students, a well-known diagram from Winter's textbook where it shows the different kinds of freshies. And you can see this is the quartz and quasite uh, boundary. And so within the UHP domain, you should expect only quasite. And the diamond graphite boundary lies somewhere here. So if the rocks are metamorphosed at such high pressures, you will get diamond provided carbon is there. Now, the ultra high temperature metamorphism is here in this particular area where you have very high temperatures, more than 900 degrees and pressures maximum up to 12 kilobars. So these are two extreme conditions of metamorphism. And hence, I gave that title that metamorphism under extreme pressure and temperature conditions. Now, this is a diagram which shows the uh, temperature, temperature versus depth uh, plots of the different metamorphic terrains. And as you can see, the ultra high temperature metamorphism are these orange colored circles, which are lying at the high temperature region and relatively low pressure. And the UHP region are all these uh, uh, blue rectangles. So you can see that in case of UHP metamorphism, rocks can go down to a depth of 200 kilometers even. So this is well within the mantle under any conditions. So crustal rocks going into the mantle is a problem. How does it go? And then how does it come back? These are the two issues that, uh, that are we have to deal when we talk about UHP metamorphism. 
So UHP metamorphism, we talk about how the rocks go down and how the rocks come up from such great depths. And in case of UHT metamorphism, we talk mostly about how the rocks get so much of heat. That's the uh, main question that we will be bothered about. Now, this is the pressure temperature diagram for all the mineral reactions in case of uh, mm, pellitic rocks. And as you can see that in the high pressure region, the minerals are different than the low pressure regions and high temperature regions, the minerals are also different. So they are characteristically different in UHP and UHT conditions. Now, another thing that you must note here is that we require very high pressure temp by temperature field gradient if we want to reach this pressure. And we need a very low pressure by temperature gradient if you want to reach these temperatures. This is only up to 800, but it can go beyond this as well. So you see that these are the different reasons why we have UHP and UHT metamorphism. Now, students may recall the classical Miyashiro uh, concept of uh, metamorphic fascist series. Way back in 1961, Miyashiro postulated metamorphic fascist series based on metamorphic field gradients. And this is Miyashiro's high pressure fascist series, and this is Miyashiro's low pressure fascist series. Now, why we had to wait for up to 1980 to know about UHT metamorphism? Because we ignored some key experimental data, and like Henson and Green 1973, which showed that the certain mineral assemblages in pellitic rocks indicate very high temperature, and they were reported in the literature, but nobody took cognizance of the fact that they were exceptional. Secondly, in very high temperature contact aureole, certain uh, mineral assemblages were found, and they were found in regional metamorphic terrains as well, but never paid any attention. We never paid any attention to this. So we had to wait till 1980 to know that rocks can indeed be metamorphosed under UHT metamorphism. A third point is that we de depended very much on mineralogical thermometry. Now, you know that this mineralogical thermometry is based on iron magnesium exchange equilibrium which resets during cooling. So what happens is that the FEMG ratio changes with cooling and you get lower temperatures. So you are not certainly getting the ultra high temperature metamorphism, even if the rocks were metamorphosed to such temperatures. If you use uh, mineralogical thermometry, you need to be very, very careful to choose your minerals, choose your uh, formulations, only then you can get the evidence of UHT metamorphism. This is a very crucial point. Now, how do we establish UHT conditions? We use mineral assemblages and reaction textures in some appropriate rocks, which record those mineral assemblages. For example, we use uh, high magnesium aluminum granulites, calc silicate granulites, and some meta iron stone. And these are the rocks which we look for, which we uh, definitely record UHT metamorphism assemblages if they were metamorphosed to such conditions. Then we compare with the experimentally determined pressure temperature diagrams we use a thing called fossil thermometry. Now, what is fossil thermometry? It means that we are using the compositions 
uh, that existed at the peak metamorphic conditions, but they have been reset, but we are using some techniques to go back to the peak metamorphic conditions to find out a composition and then carry out the thermometry. And of course, as I said, one can do mineralogical thermometry after careful selection of grains. Then this diagram shows you age versus temperature of the uh, UHT rocks. Look at the uh, orange ones, please. And you will see that the UHT metamorphism uh, occurred at certain specific times. We had a good occurrence at the Archean Proterozoic boundary. Almost you can see here at the Archean Proterozoic boundary. Then we have around 1.8 billion years ago. Now, if you recall, this is the time when Columbia formed. So then again, you have a cluster here when Rodinia formed. A last cluster comes here when Gondwana formed. So there is a correlation between the occurrence of UHT metamorphism with the formation of the supercontinents. So they are linked somehow. And we have to find out that why such a thing happened. Now, this is the diagram of the different uh, uh, ultra high temperature metamorphism occurrences. And we will only look at these ones, which are more than 900 degrees Celsius. And we have a candidate here. This is our Eastern Hearts mobile belt on the east coast of India, where you have real evidence of very ultra high temperature metamorphism. We will look at it in more details later. And this is the latest position about five, six years back when we have the total about 50 or 60 occurrences of ultra high temperature metamorphism all over the world. And you may have a look at India and you can see quite a lot of uh, things here in India. This is Eastern Guards belt. This is Kerala condylite belt and so on. So we have several occurrences of UHT metamorphism in India. It is not that rare. Only thing is that we failed to uh, understand the significance of UHT metamorphism 40 years back. And only then we now understand very clearly and you can see lots in Australia and other Antarctica and other places. Now, I was talking about the key mineral assemblages and mineral compositions which indicate UHT metamorphism. The minerals we should look for is the coexistence of sapphirin and quartz, spinel and quartz, Olastonite and scapolite, these two, the last one in calcilicate rocks. Then we should analyze the orthopyroxene. This is a very characteristic uh, composition of orthopyroxene in UHT rocks. We have more than 10 wet percent of Al2O3. Now, any textbook will tell you that orthopyroxene is MGFESI2O6. There is no Al2O3 in the traditional definition of orthopyroxene. But in case of UHT metamorphism, we get orthopyroxene, which contains more than 10 wet percent of Al2O3. I will tell you how aluminum goes into orthopyroxene structure. Then we should have very high androdite garnet in calcilicate granulite, very rich in androdite. Then you can have some inverted pigeonite in meta iron. So these are the characteristic assemblages. And unless you get these assemblages in your rocks, it will be extremely difficult to say whether UHT metamorphism happened or not. This is what we call fossil thermometry. See, this is a typical parthite X solution. You have the 
potash feldspar and the plagioclase exsolved like this what we do we take an x-ray image of the whole thing and integrate the composition together to find out the composition of the homogeneous grain before exsolation and then we try to plot it on this ternary diagram ternary plagioclase diagram and our eastern ghats the uh, parthites they fall here and you can see these are the isotherms uh, 1000 degree 1100 and so on so our eastern ghats granulites are plotting at very high temperatures if we integrate this composition so if i analyze this uh, plagioclase and this potash feldspar the light one is potash feldspar the dark one is plagioclase and then take an x-ray image and combine it together so that i get an pre exsolution original composition and that falls here so that tells me that the rock was very highly high temperature metamorphosed now this is how the aluminum enters into the orthopyroxene by what is called as shellmack substitution 2al goes in against mg and si 2al can go against fe and si you see the charge balance 2al is 6 valency and here 2 plus 4 6 2 4 6 6 so this is how the substitution takes place and in case of uht metamorphism our orthopyroxenes from eastern ghats fell here which is nearly 1000 degrees celsius so this shows that in case of uht metamorphism the orthopyroxene is very anomalously aluminum rich now people recently tried this what is called tres element thermometry where they got some evidence of uht metamorphism like here these are the two tres element thermometers that people have used one is called zirconium in rutile another is titanium in zircon and now these are difficult things to measure even with a microprobe but nevertheless if you can measure these uh, minor amounts then you can get some evidence of uht metamorphism so this is a tres element thermometry which came much later about 10 years back people started using it now we look at the two rocks that i were talking about calc silicate granulites and the saffron spinel granulites let us start with the calc silicate granulites this is the petrogenetic grit pt grit with the different mineral reactions plotted and i will request you to look at this yellow region this is the region of the stability field of olastomite scapolite and plagioclase and please look at the temperature here so this is the characteristic assemblage of uht calc silicate granulites we have to find out that whether these assemblages were stable at peak conditions now for example if i look at this texture you will see big grains of olastonite and plagioclase but they are separated by garnet here and some quartz here so these are now that the reaction is olastonite plus plagioclase giving rise to garnet plus quartz the second slide shows the olastonite and scapolite separated by garnet and calcite and quartz according to this reaction now this if i forget about this separation by garnet i understand that at one point of time before garnet formed olastonite and scapolite were together and this is where i will look at the region of uht conditions because they were stable at the previous condition the third texture shows the breakdown of scapolite to calcite and plagioclase again if i look at this diagram this figure then i know that scapolite was stable earlier 
and this is the field of scapolite. So again, scapolite is stable about around 900 degrees Celsius. So you can expect that anything above 900 is possible if you have scapolite. So these three textures will define that originally you have an olestonite scapolite assemblage, and this assemblage then is characteristic of ultra high temperature metamorphism. So you have to establish that the olestonite and scapolite were present earlier. Now that they might be separated by garnet or they might be separated by something, some reaction must have taken place, but do not bother about the reaction. We try to find out the original minerals and the original minerals are still there and we have found olestonite and scapolite, so we can easily say that the rocks were initially UHT metamorphosed, and later they cooled, so that garnet came into existence here. So they cooled. So that is quite normal. Now, if I look at the saffron spinel granulites, then we will look at these three minerals, saffron, quartz, and spinel. Look at the temperature here. This field is above 900 degrees Celsius. So this is characteristic of UHT conditions. Now, how do I know that? The first figure shows coarse saffron and coarse quartz separated by this orthopyroxene and silimanite. I forget about orthopyroxene and silimanite. I will see that this saffron was present together with quartz at the peak condition, and these minerals formed later during cooling. So the pre-existing saffron and quartz indicate that the rock was ultra high temperature metamorphosed. I will ignore these coronetic textures. I will think about the original peak metamorphic conditions. The same thing here when we have spinel and quartz separated by garnet and silimanite. I will again ignore garnet and silimanite. They formed later. But originally, spinel was present with quartz. And saffron, spinel, and quartz together, they define ultra high temperature conditions. As you can see, their field is more than 950 degrees Celsius. So if you have, if you can establish that saffron and quartz or spinel and quartz were stable at the peak metamorphic conditions, then you know that the rock has been metamorphosed at ultra high temperature conditions. And you have to ignore these textures then. These are important but these are cooling textures. These will not give you the ultra high temperature conditions. So this is again the same diagram where it shows that the uh, stability field of spinel, quartz, saffron, silimanite, etc. This entire field is in the UHT domain. So if you have these minerals, then you are confident about UHT metamorphism. But please, one point I would emphasize that you must uh, prove that quartz was present in the rock along with spinel and saffron. If, because uh, in the absence of quartz, both spinel and saffron can occur at lower temperature conditions. So you need to establish that quartz was present in the rock at the peak conditions. This is again the same diagram, almost the later one is 2014 diagram, where you can see the field of spinel quartz, <coughs> magnetites and saffron quartz, rutile and saffron quartz, magnetite, all are above 950 degrees Celsius, all above 950. So if you have these mineral assemblages, you are sure of ultra high temperature metamorphism. So somehow people saw these assemblages, but they did not know that these represent some unusually hot conditions. That was the problem. 
So we not that, that these assemblages were discovered in 1980. People knew about it, but they didn't, could not interpret in terms of the speciality of the assemblage. I will show you two, three slides on very peculiar oxide mineral intergrowths that we get in this kind of rocks, corundum and sillimanite. Corundum and sillimanite together means there should be a mulite originally. And this mulite is an ultra high temperature mineral that we know. Then we have this kind of intergrowth between ilmenite, corundum, and magnetite. And this is formed by this reaction, which is experimentally we know occurs at extremely high temperatures, 900 or 1000 degrees Celsius. This is a corundum ilmenite intergrowth, very unusual. And you have to find these things to establish UHT conditions and see that how magnetite absorbed in spinel. And the experimental data shows that the temperature should be more than 1100 degrees Celsius before exsolution. So these are the right indicators of UHT conditions. And now even orthopyroxene can exsolve out spinel and safarin. See the beautiful crystallographic intergrowth of spinel in orthopyroxene or safarin in orthopyroxene. This shows that highly aluminous orthopyroxene solid solution was there from which these minerals absorbed out during cooling and the temperature is again more than 1000 degrees Celsius. See this peculiar texture of garnet exsolving out of orthopyroxene. Have you ever seen it? I saw it only in one or two cases. This is the garnet exsolving out in crystallographic directions of orthopyroxene. This is again a rare occurrence and this shows that the rocks were metamorphosed at very high temperatures because garnet is an aluminous mineral it has exsolved out. So at the peak condition, orthopyroxene had a lot of aluminum in it. And that is how garnet could exsolve out of the aluminous orthopyroxene. This is a typical worm-like intergrowth of orthopyroxene and cordyrite uh, forming at the boundary of garnet crystals. This is a cooling texture. This is a uh, lowering of pressure texture when garnet breaks down to orthopyroxene and cordyrite. So there can be several such indicative textures which one has to find out to comment on UHT metamorphism. Now coming to the conditions of UHT metamorphism, let's say at 40 kilometers depth, we need a very high upper crustal heat production. That means these areas must have contained a lot of radiogenic elements in the upper crust. And that's why the heat production was high. Then you need a slow erosion because of the simple thing that if you erode fast, then you cool the rocks fast. So they will not preserve the UHT conditions. Then you have to suppress the partial melting of rocks. Why suppress? Because if you allow partial melting to progress, then if you add heat to the rock, the temperature is, does not increase, you get more partial melting. That's all. So unless the rock is somehow, the partial melting is suppressed, you don't get the record of UHT conditions. Then of course, you need suitable tectonic setting that allows long period of stability at the high condition, high temperature conditions. You should not allow the very unstable tectonic setting where the rocks are quickly coming up to the surface. That means they will cool very quickly so that you won't see the uh, UHT effect. And these are the some of the tectonic conditions that have been predicted. Now you see, uh, Basically, if you want UHT metamorphism at this depth, 
you need to increase the temperature. Now, how can you increase the temperature? One way is by the slab, the descending slab break off. And if the slab breaks off, then the area cannot remain vacant. So it has to be filled up. So what happens? The asthenosphere, which is hot, that comes up. And if the asthenosphere comes up, then the temperature increases. The same thing is here, the crustal delamination. If a piece of the crust goes, delaminates and goes down, then this area is filled up by the asthenosphere. And again, the asthenosphere is hotter than the lithosphere. So what happens is that the temperature increases. You can have uh, by magmatic underplating, by lot of magma emplacement at the base of the crust, you can increase the temperature, hot magma emplacement, or you can have the uh, extensional orogenic system where you have the back arc or other uh, areas where you have an extensional uh, orogenic system and you have the asthenosphere going up and causing the temperature increase. So basically, you can also create a new model, but basically the condition is that you need to increase the temperature. And for that, you need to bring the asthenosphere at a higher levels because the asthenosphere is at higher temperature than the lithosphere. So what happens if the asthenosphere goes up then the temperature increases. Now, going back to now to ultra high pressure metamorphism, I repeat this slide, which tells you about the pressure should be more than 27 kilobar and the temperature should be more than 600 degrees Celsius. I have already shown this slide, so I will skip this and go to the conditions. The pelletic rocks under UHP conditions will be called white schists. So you all know about green schists, but these are in the low pressure temperature rocks. And in these cases, there's no green mineral in it. So that is why the rock is absolutely white. So they are called white schists. And they should contain coesite, magnesium, garnet, and diamond if carbon is available. If, you, if there was no carbon in the rock, you don't get diamond. And then mafic rocks can be very dry eclogite with uh, gross pyrite garnet, that is grossular pyro garnet, or even majority garnet at great depths. And there are certain very interesting minerals like ellenbergite, silica-rich clinoperoxine and other UHP indicators. So you have to look for these minerals to establish that the rock is UHP metamorphosed. People did not look at the significance of these minerals till somebody in 1983 working in the Italian Alps found these occurrences and then interpreted them as because of extreme pressure conditions and this entire new thing of UHP metamorphism came into literature. The entire credit goes to the PhD thesis of one French worker who worked in the Italian Alps, a famous locality called Dora Moira. This is the occurrence of UHP rocks, and this is Dora Moira here. This is, and this is the near Zermatt in Switzerland and North Italy, the junction of that, you have these peculiar rocks which are white colored, and people map them as quartzites originally. Now we know that these are the indicators of ultra high pressure metamorphism. And coming to India, where we have it, in Ladakh, this is the famous So Morari Lake, So Morari area, where from 2001 people described quasite and then diamond here. And this is the Kohistan area. This is falling in Pakistan, but this is very much our. And you can go there, have a good field work in So Morari. 
and uh, you can see by yourself the beautiful UHP metamorphosed rocks. So you will see that there are some occurrences of UHP rocks all over the world, but in India we have one only confirmed UHP rocks in the Himalayas that is in the Ladakh area. And these are the textures that you need to look. Now you see that, as I said, quartzite is unstable at lower pressure conditions, so it gets converted into quartz, but you can still get some relic quartzite within quartz. And these are the cracks which develop because when quartzite changes to quartz, the volume expands. And in order for that expansion causes this cracking. And even if you don't find quartzite inclusion, if you see those cracks around quartz, you can predict that this was originally quartzite. And please remember that to identify quartzite is not a very easy job. You need Raman spectroscopy to identify it because compositionally this is SiO2. So you analyze it in the microprobe, you get SiO2 only. This is the mineral Ellen Bergite, and this is something, a peculiar composition, Mg6, TiAl, some peculiar. I am sure you have not heard about it, neither did I uh, before reading the literature. Now, this is a very peculiar mineral, and if you find this mineral in garnet somewhere, you are sure that the rock is an UHP uh, metamorphosed rock because this mineral is not stable under pressures less than 30 to 40 kilobar. This way, and this is the gentleman who can be credited for discovery of UHP metamorphism, Christian Chopin, and uh, he discovered it in 1983. That's his PhD thesis. See, clinopyroxene exolving out quartz. Now, this is unique. That means that the clinopyroxene was very rich in quartz, SiO2 at the peak metamorphic conditions. And this is possible only at extreme pressure conditions. And these are micro diamonds, which are found in zircon. And these are micro diamonds. Of course, unfortunately, not very big diamonds that you can wear in your ring, but these are micro diamonds. Nevertheless, they indicate that the carbon was present and the rock was metamorphosed at such high pressures so that graphite became diamond. So this is, a, this is an absolutely foolproof example of ultra high pressure metamorphism. Then again, the last two textures are also very peculiar. You get a solution of orthopyroxene in garnet. Now, you recall that in case of ultra high temperature metamorphism, I showed you the opposite exolution. Here I am showing you orthopyroxene exolving out in garnet. So it means it's a very silica rich garnet which was originally present, and this is possibly a majority garnet. And then even you have potash feldspar exolving from clinopyroxene. Now, clinopyroxene takes potassium at extremely high pressure conditions. This is experimentally known. And so, a solution of potash feldspar like this in clinopyroxene will tell you that this uh, rock mineral was stable at extremely high pressure conditions. So, UHP metamorphism requires a very high DPDT field gradient. That is to say, the pressure has to increase far more than the temperature so that you get such high pressures at moderate temperatures. Now, how can you get it? you can take an oceanic crust to such depth due to subduction. Most all of the UHP metamorphism rocks are found near ancient subduction zones only. So we know 
that subduction is responsible. And the oceanic crust can go to such mantle depths if it is very old and if it is cold. Only then the density will be high and the gravitational pull will be high and so the oceanic crust can go to such depth. And if a continental fragment is attached with the oceanic crust, it can be taken to such a great depth but at some point of time, the continental crust will be detached and then it bounces back at shallower levels. Because continental crust is of lighter density, so it will bounce back to shallower levels. And the return journey may be facilitated by partial melting or otherwise it can come back as a tectonic wedge. And unless it can come back, we cannot see it today. And the so morari uh, occurrence is such an tectonic wedge where the continental crust was subducted to a depth of nearly 180 kilometers that is within the mantle and then it came back. How did it come back? So these are the models. Normally what happens to people think that after taking the material to great depth, then you can bring it either by channel flow kind of thing or by tectonic waging and the wage can be near the surface so that after some erosion, this rock is exposed. For so Murari, we think that wage extrusion, that is the model that has happened place, happened. And so that is why we are seeing the so Murari rocks right on the surface today. So these are the models. These are taken from the literature. You have the references, Web et al. 2011. And this is the what is the, uh, for So Morari, this is the model where you have this uh, subduction at 52 million years, just uh, at the beginning or slightly before the formation of the Himalayas. And then you have a metamorphism at 27 million years. And then you have the doming when the mountain that is around 11 to 9 million years. So this is the uh, situation where the uh, continental fragment went down at 52 million years before and then came up at around 11 to 9 million years before. So it took some time, about 35, 40 million years for the whole process to go. And then the rocks came up to the surface, near the surface, and then erosion took over and the rock was exposed. And we can see so Moradi, if you go to Ladakh, you can see the rock which went down to 180 kilometers depth and has come up like this. So this is an extremely interesting uh, occurrence, and I think as a student of geology or field work, I mean, this, uh, this is a unique opportunity if you go and see these rocks. Of course, the terrain is difficult, and it is at a, an altitude of only 5,000 meters, so uh, field work is not that easy. In any case, this is worth visiting for any geology student. So finally, thanks to the Central University of Punjab for the invitation to present this talk. And particularly, I address the students that if you have any question, you, other than asking me here, if some question props up in your mind later, you can write to me at this particular address that I have shown you. And we prepared one uh, document, which is available on the way which is um, a similar topic, metamorphism under UHT and UHP conditions. It was prepared in connection with the e partial scheme of UGC, and it is in the InfibNet website where I uh, presented this talk, uh, uh, that talk in a video which is available there. They call it self-learning, and you can also see the e-text with all the references that I talked about. So please visit this website 
and you can see the uh, not this lecture that was uh, uh, a kind of different lecture but the question is at least if you forget something if you have some questions you can get some answers from this particular thing so this gives you uh, this is a video presentation as well as the text is there Uh, th thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for a wonderful topic. Uh, I'm sure that uh, whoever listening, whoever joining today's webinar would definitely gain a lot of information in terms of uh, uh, metamorphism under extreme present temperature conditions. And sir, is categorically explained each and every component uh, involved in this process. And Sir has also mentioned about the place in and around Indian subcontinent where we can actually see the places. So Sir, uh, we have lots of questions from our students, okay. uh, both first year and second year students, but due uh, to limitation time, we, we cannot uh, actually uh, address all of them, but uh, just few of them. I'm just speaking on the behalf of them. Uh, one question is that what kind of processes and depths beneath Earth can we withdraw in accordance to plate movement if we counter UHP ultramafic xenoliths of mental affinity? Ah. Uh, that's a different thing. If it is a mantle affinity, then the rock come, is coming from the mantle, like in kimberlite. You get uh, mantle-derived rocks. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about crustal rocks which are going down at that depth. So if these are, suppose it is not a mantle affinity rock, it's a crustal affinity rock which has gone down to the mantle depth. So this is not the situation like what we get in the kimberlites. For example, you have the kimberlites diamonds there, but that diamond originated in the mantle, mm -hmm. uh, continental lithospheric mantle and carried by the kimberlite magma because the kimberlite comes from great depth. But here, what I have described is a crustal rock going down to 180 kilometer depth. It's not a mantle affinity, it is a crustal affinity rock. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much uh, for wonderful uh, response, sir. And uh, probably last question, uh, last question. Okay, okay. Uh, one more question from the student uh, uh, that uh, why graphite occurs in fondalite, sir? Okay, <laughs> okay, that's not uh, really UHT or UHP, but yeah, because there was carbon in, in the sediments. Originally, carbonaceous matter in the sediments, and that was metamorphosed into graphite. So you have, for example, in a sedimentary rock, you have carbonaceous shell, for example, you get carbonaceous shell in sedimentary rocks. Now, suppose you metamorphose it to 800, 900 degrees Celsius, you will get a condolite, but this carbon in the carbonaceous shell now will be a graphite. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, and uh, uh, KK, one thing is that uh, please share my email ID with all the students. Yes, definitely, sir. We are going to do that. And, uh, yeah. Because yes, we don't have the to write any, any question to me. Yes. So we are going to uh, share sir's email ID and you all can just write to sir so that sir can respond. Uh, any other questions right now? If uh, anybody have uh, some query so that you can directly contact sir from the audience. You can you can write in the chat box as well. So uh, may I request uh, our uh, head of the department, Dr. J.K. 
part naik to uh, proceed uh, to proceed uh, further okay thank you sir thank you for your wonderful lecture actually we have in the beforehand we have collected all the questions from the first year and second year questions so out of that few selected question only we have asked here and, and definitely i will share your email id with them if they have further query after listening the talk they can write to you and uh, yes, they can. you can write to me even one year later no problem <laughs> <laughs> yeah because uh, yeah they will learn and they will uh, ask their doubt if you have any so yeah so any other question from the audience uh, no okay so we'll move to the next part of this uh, event that is uh, coming to the last part that is uh, thanksgiving part so it's a uh, immense pleasure for me to give vote of thanks but uh, i would uh, uh, tell here that before starting the talk actually we could not introduce uh, professor uh, somna das gupta uh, because of some reason so i would just briefly tell about uh, professor somna das gupta because many students are there if you if you look at the somna sir's biodata it's uh, it's like uh, it's uh, it's like difficult to cover actually in this uh, occasion so what i will do i briefly i will read and i i am sure that student will get uh, benefit out of uh, these things so if you look if i look at the professor somga uh, somda uh, somna das gupta cv biodata it is like it itself he itself is an uh, institution and uh, if you uh, currently professor somnath das gupta is uh, in a senior scientist at uh, icer kolkata and he has uh, fellow of indian academy of science fellow of indian national science academy fellow of national academy of science fellow of west bengal academy of science and technology is the fellow of academy of science for the developing world uh, and member of american chemical society and if you look at his uh, academic and administrative position he has uh, served as vice chancellor of assam university he was a director of national center for experimental mineralogy and petrology university of allahabad he was adjunct professor at indian school of mines dhanbad he was distinguished visiting professor at indian institute of technology bombay between 2014 and 16 he was the uh, ford foundation chair professor at jamia millia islamia in new delhi between 2016 to 17 he uh, he received many awards so few of them if i name here he was the jc bus uh, fellow from dst uh, government of india he received teachers award from indian national science academy in 2014 he received bn wadia medal from indian national science academy in 2018 and many more to this particular list our list so he also received many international awards he was the recipient of post doctoral fellowship from government of japan in 1984-85 he was the recipient fellowship of uh, humboldt foundation in 1992 9192 to 2006 2008 2011 2017 <laughs> he also awarded as a guest professorship by german research foundation between 2002 to 2003 he was awarded visiting professorship by okido university in 2007 he has guided successfully 20 phd student and he has completed 15 major research project and uh, the list of publication and if you look at the each h index i i10 index is huge i10 index is around 88 and h index around 40 so it is like a privilege for us to have here today with us after listening to your wonderful lecture i i hope that many student might have developed interest to learn more about the ultra high pressure temperature metamorphism it was indeed good, always good to listen professor das gupta he always used to present complex process and concept in very simplified manner when i was at icer kolkata i remember student used to run so because uh, their students used to call him sdg sir so in the short form they used to call sdg sir so he used to uh, uh, they used to run for uh, some of sir's class 
and uh, they never miss the uh, somna sir's class actually today we are lucky to have you with us i personally and on behalf of the department and the university would like to express sincere thanks for accepting our invitation and find your uh, time from your busy schedule to be with us and deliver such a wonderful talk one second thank you sir for joining us today Organ organizing this lecture could not have been possible without the support and encouragement and guidance of our honorable vice chancellor professor raghavendra prasad tiwari his dynamic leadership motivated us to initiate different scientific pro scientific programs and activities at our department sir on behalf of the department and school and on my behalf i express my sincere thanks for your graceful presence during our in uh, initial uh, lecture and during the lecture and support to organize this event i am very much thankful to professor vk gar dean student of uh, welfare senior professor of the school environment uh, school of the environment and arts science he was our source of inspiration and always led from the front Uh, sir i am thankful to you for your valuable time suggestion and support to successfully complete uh, this lecture and i am thankful to dr sunil mittal associate dean school of environment and arts science as well as he is the head of the department of environment science and technology for his continuous support and encouragement to organize this event i also express my sincere thanks and gratitude to all my colleague dr krishnakant who was moderating today and dr milan kumar he was handling this uh, google meet as well as the youtube one dr rahul from the our department dr sasang vite hod in charge from department of geography for their continuous support i also express my sincere thanks and gratitude to all my colleagues students and scientists from different university and from this university who have joined with us through the google meet through the youtube uh, i am thankful to you all i also thanks all the research scholar of the department and because they are the the, the drive force behind organizing all the event and all and uh, special thanks to miss amrita for preparing very nice uh, flyers and i also express my sincere thanks to administrative non teaching and support staff of the university to make this event successful thank you so much thank you thank you so much jiten thank you okay. very much and thanks to everybody who was present uh, okay thank you sir the last last uh, part as per the program schedule uh, we will conclude the session with the national anthem so i request everyone please rise from your seat to for the national anthem <laughs> ಜಯಾ <laughs> thank you sir bye sir ಹಲೋ <laughs>